operation of FEMA that would be a little bigger problem. So. These are also considered non contributory costs because they're just money you're throwing out the window. So I call it throwing in the lake. You know what I mean? Um, I've owned a business over time and uh, I've used it whenever something comes along and it's just an unexpected cost, what I believe unnecessary cost, drive your nuts. I consider throwing money on a lake because there's no value, there's no return. You know what I mean? There's no need to have done it. So whenever you think about wasting money, you know what I mean? Companies are not fans of it either. So, Direct and indirect costs must be added together to determine the total cost impact from workers' compensation. Those workers' compensation do not contribute directly to the steps, growth, and profit of the organization. This is a non-contributory cost, and therefore comes directly from profit dollars. And it's a sales dollars impact. Since workers' compensation costs impact the bottom line on a dollar basis, it impacts the company's total sales. Okay, let's say that a different industry has, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that you're in an industry that makes 5% margin across the board. After everything's said and done, your company profits at the end are 5%. That's not bad. It's actually pretty good for, for large companies. That's actually going to be bad. They're not that high. And I mean, they, they can be much smaller, okay? But I'm just going to use this for, for simple dollars. If you have a injury, not only are you going to have your forklift down, your ladder down, your person search, product search, whatever's happening, you could easily have $100,000. That may be a little high for an average injury. You have 20, 25,000 wrapped up into a claim. Okay? At 5%, you need to make $20 for $1. Make the difference. So to make that profit back up, of a $25,000 claim, you need to make 20 times that just to get back to even if it never happened. So when you see about, we talk about non contributory cost, they, in workers' compensation, if you're having injuries and it should be higher than what it needs to be, it gets into the non contributory cost factor. And at that point in time, again, back to not being able to bid jobs. I've seen companies comp so high, they, not, they weren't able to bid jobs. They were just able to get the small little jobs, people would come home, stuff like that. But the bigger jobs, they, they couldn't bid them out because they just couldn't stay in business. And then companies find out you're super high comp, but then they, they, they shave their bid to where, you know, it's going to put you out of business to, to bid against them. And then there's one less competitor, and they have to shave their bid up. So literally, they just got rid of the competitor. They hired your old guys, they trained them to be safe. Now they're making even more money. So here we go, 10%, again, 10%, $10 for $1, you know what I mean, 25,000 to 250,000, you know what I mean? So we're talking about, you may need to up your sales a half a million dollars in sales if it's at 5%. I think it's pretty, pretty aggressive. <coughs> Total sales dollars required to pay for both direct and indirect workers' compensation to be kept below 1% of total company sales. If you do that, it's going to help you out. Going to keep you running. Why do accidents happen? Okay, I can tell you this much. How many people, and we're all guys in here, okay, I'm going to go on a limb and say that we've all done something that we can't believe we lived through in our teens, or early 20s, or prior to that. If I'm wrong with anybody, raise your hand. <laughs> a fluke of nature, the first one in history. Okay, we're not naturally safe. It just is what it is. How many, I mean, how many people are born naturally safe? You know what I mean? I can tell you, it, for me, it's definitely not that way. Uh, my grandmother is full-blooded crazy Irish, okay? I mean, maniac level. My dad's got half of it. I've got a quarter of it. So uh, we keep getting diluted out. And I can't imagine. When I, we had this, I remember when I was a kid, we weren't allowed to play in the woods. So what do me and my friends all want to do? If my mom said, go put it, it's all you want, we'd be in our front yard. You know what I mean? That's just the way, you know, it's going to be. We would ride our bikes through there, and we found all the trails and all this kind of stuff. And we had, there's a creek that ran through. Come down, and really just a big hill, and the little up, and then a creek. And right on the other side of that creek, oh, it was psychotic. I can't imagine it seeing, if I watched somebody do it today, that I'd be sure they're going to die before they get to the bottom. There were two trees on the side. They were not as far apart, the two trees, as that is to one side of the lake to the other, on the other side of this creek. 
And at the very, very end, you're gonna just do a slight turn. Not a huge turn, but a slight turn. Wow. And I've seen someone not make the turn enough. <laughs> I've seen what happens when you don't make the turn. Because what happens is, is you go right into the tree on the left. And I had to carry my buddy out of the woods once because he didn't make the turn. Well, it was awful. And my other buddy had to walk two bikes. You know, it was, <laughs> there was three of us down there and he didn't make enough of a turn to get between the two trees. Laughing your ass off the whole way. <laughs> no, he was, we were afraid he was hurt. Yeah, at that point in time, it was pretty scary. We were, I don't know, about 12 or something. And, you know, just young enough to not be afraid of what you should, you should be afraid of. And uh, the problem we have is, is this doesn't really get any better without training. You know what I mean? Yes, we touched the hot pan. Oh, we touched it again. Okay, let's stop. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, maybe twice I'm going to gamble, but after three times it's, it's out. So, but we haven't done all the things yet. And, and one of the problems we have as companies when we're hiring in people, and it's not to the same degree as it was once, uh, hiring, they were typically hiring a lot of younger individuals who haven't had the life experiences of the individuals who've been there for some of the, the companies that they're bringing in. So they just happen because people haven't seen, they don't know, they haven't had enough stories, they haven't been around some of the disasters that motivate them to do the right things. So accidents do not happen by accident, they're, they're caused. Uh, there are many reasons. They usually happen from repeated activities. Again, was it the first time? I'm going to tell you the guys, Brian McDuffie, we're still friends this day, down in Georgia, beautiful family, whole nine yards, smart guy, a whole, has a good job. But if I could tell his wife and his kids the stories of the dumb things he did when we were kids, she wouldn't believe half of them. You know what I mean? Now, my wife, she'd believe them. I mean, I'm just telling you. She'd be like, she'd probably expect the worst. But for this guy, it wasn't his first time going down this hill, okay? All fairness is probably did it 25, 30, 40 times, all of us, you know what I mean? Me and my two, two other friends, we were around together. He probably did it a ton of times, and this was the first time where it just didn't get quite enough of a turn, and we would measure, we would stand back there, and we would sit there, and we'd see how high the back wheel would go across the trees, and that's who would win. So the more crazy you got, the better. I mean, what did you win on your cool this one today? We got those carrying home, but he was on the block. Said, "What happened? He ain't make the turn." <laughs> that's, that's about the way to down. He missed the turn, huh? Yes, he did. And he's crying the whole way. He's plugged up too a little bit, so it was a little scarier than normal for us. But uh, I'd take him to his mom and be like, "Yeah, he's on his bike." We didn't tell him the whole truth. Hey, did they move him off the turn by here? No. My mom was like, no, no man. not everyone knew about it. They all been doing it. You ain't gonna do but, that again, are you? Uh, we, we didn't. We didn't tell everyone the full story at the time. They all, I mean, our parents all knew. You know, years later. Yeah. But at that point in time, we still wanted to do it again. Right. You know, he me. I don't remember if he did it anymore. But yeah, so we just had we fell on the bike, and that's what happened. So uh, the problem people have with doing something over and 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 over again is you don't, yes, you're confident in what you're doing, you don't see the immediate threat. You work around something that's unguarded. You work around something, you do something a hundred times. Oh, I've done it a hundred times. When I first started in the safety world, I remember I was about 26 years old and I looked like I was 15, okay? So I would go into these companies and try to do lockout, tagout training and tell people to put guards on equipment and, and things of this nature, why it's good for them. And these 30-year-old electricians and stuff are looking at me, I've been doing this since before you were born, kid. You know what I mean? And, and it's one, it was true, but then I would sit there and ask them. I'm like, okay, okay, you know, because I was told to ask them this. You know I mean? <clears throat> Let me ask you this, as you've been doing this obviously 30, 40 years, you really know what's going on, okay? I said, how, how do you test if, how do you, you know, how do you know if something's 110 or 220 if you're just looking at it? Oh, how do you, you know, the, the old timers test? You think I've watched people, I couldn't stop them. I wasn't quick enough. <laughs> I mean, when I, was, when I was 19 years old, I could knock out people in three seconds. True story. I wasn't quick enough to stop these old timers licking their fingers and <laughs> grabbing current. But that's how they would tell, oh, it's 220. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, complete utter shock on the first time I've seen one. Yeah, shock, yeah, pun intended. That's actually good. It wasn't, but it is now. From now on, it won't be. 
<laughs> so I'm watching these guys do this, and they've done it how many times? A million times. Repeated individuals. Then I ask them this. Did you know anybody who ever got like shot really bad, burned, or wound up dead? Oh yeah, and then they could all tell me they all went with their guys. <laughs> so you've done it forever, but meanwhile the other people you've known who've done it like you, out of ten of them, three of them didn't make it. I said, do you think that's my skill or luck? You know what I mean? Take it on. Exactly. Well, if I'm throwing a dice and I'm seven out of ten, I'm going to be rich. But in reality, you know, it's just the way it goes. I'm like, okay, so you can tell me, you know, a guy who got shot real bad, you know, a guy who had a thing blow up on him, you know, somebody who got killed or burned. Hey, the electric guy is crazy. Well, I mean, trust me, the concrete driver used to go and chip out the back of their trucks with nothing but a bandana with their mouths. Well, so it, you, you look at all the industries, the chemicals, the electricity, the concrete, anything, you, any industry you want to get into, the old timers all did something pretty crazy, okay, that we would look at today and think, why would someone do that? And meanwhile, it was just what was accepted. So I, I, say, I say this to the point to where, yeah, that guy made it through. You know what? The fact that he's been on 30, 35 years, he probably could get away with me a little more than a young electrician could get away with. Because he truly does know. He does have friends and people who know, I just screw this up a little bit or got a screwdriver a little too close and they arced into something that glued and sucked in the cop and the lungs or whatever. But it's one of those situations to where you still shouldn't do it. You shouldn't train the new guys to do it. Why take the Well, because you can't. Some people have done something they don't see it as a risk. I guarantee you, after the third or fourth time I went down that, I didn't even think about blast into a tree. You know what the odds of my buddy getting hit in a tree versus me versus my, my third friend? It was one of three. One of us was eventually going to smash a tree. It was just which one was literally rolling the dice. You know what I mean? And it didn't come up my number, thank goodness. But it was going to happen. We did this enough times. <laughs> something was going to hit a spot, it was going to be a little slicker today, there was going to be some leaves at the bottom, we going to, something was going to happen. We are going to wind up in the creek or in the tree, one or the other. Okay, and it just happened to be that you wound up a little bit both. So, uh, it, it's, I still, I still see it, like in one of the trees, like pure fear. It's not right beside the only time one of you guys hit the tree. We should be like well, two or three more. Well, we did kind of stop that. <laughs> we were kind of. I, I don't remember if we did it after that. How's that? I get pretty good memory. I can't remember after that, going back and doing that. I guess we realized the rattlesnake is sitting on the edge at that point in time. So, but as far as what I'm talking about, the immediate threats, they don't see the immediate threat. Meanwhile, some of the things that they would do for years and years were potentially dangerous. And then, with electricity, how many people here have felt 110? At some point in time, you bet, okay, in we're all alive, why is that? be more grounded or to make it through our heart or head. You know what I mean? But that much juice kills more people than any other, all other currents combined or voltages combined. So it's, uh, just so you know that it, it doesn't, you know, electricity, some people don't deem it as frightening as other people. Yeah. I like wires. I like wires. Well, aluminum ladder in a pool. And that's really not any better than a flood of things. Right. You use a power pool. So I guess a box would be the same here. So the box is more kept with solar. Uh, but again, almost I can't. I don't remember anybody not raising their hand that they felt 110. But meanwhile, we all realize electricity is very, very dangerous. It's something to be respected, paid attention to. And I told you a story about electricians who were just grow, grab wires and stuff and tell you what the, the voltage was. But their hands are so callous and so dry, you know what I mean, that they they had a, a little bit of resistance. To be honest with you, natural resistance and uh, the way it would work out. So, but it's the reason that it's, a, it's not an immediate threat. Secondary threats, these situations where you were not perceived by the employee as dangerous or the employee doesn't believe he or she will be injured performing the task. An occurrence scale, an occurrence is an event, anything that happens for any reason that can lead to an accident, injury, something of that nature. Once an occurrence event takes place, the results are left up to chance. The greater the number of occurrence events, the greater the number of injuries, and the greater the possibility for a serious injury. Occurrence events usually go up, go unnoticed and unreported. Employees <coughs> lose their fear for the act or the behavior, and they get used to it. An incident is where an occurrence event led to a happening, usually called a near miss. These don't usually result in injury or property damage. The next 
we have minor injuries, these make up the vast amount of injuries uh, reportable to claims. At least let's hope that the minor injuries are what comes up. Serious injuries, obviously, one starting with limited activity pain, cost of money, time, potential real you know, medical has to go on. Uh, then permanent injuries, uh, you get into anything from amputations, cross injuries, you know, severe breaks, and hopefully not even head injuries. Uh, and then deaths. And if you want to see what the occurrence scale is, <coughs> this is not a to date uh, model. It's what I can put on a computer and make it look okay. The occurrence scale, if you had everything in this room, thousand little marks go from here to the other end, you're going to get to the other end, you're going to have hopefully three, four, five uh, minor injuries. And then you're going to have a whole other room on top of this, and by the time you get to the end of that, there might be one, one fatality. Or you would hope it would be less than that, but in theory, it's just it's a very, very, very uh, large amount that goes for the incidents are, are, should be 10 times minor injuries, should be, uh, minor injuries are, it varies depending on in industry. You get into forklifts, the uh, serious and non-serious injuries literally are one third, which is extremely high. You get into like trench or ladders, 50% of all injuries that are involving a ladder go into the serious or the lost time category. Uh, it's due to typically the fall of the ladder. You, you don't have the ability to land properly or you're too high up. So, uh, but in different other areas of safety, it, it should be you know microscopic, mostly incidents, as you guys can understand. So. Uh, unsafe condition. Why do employees behave the way they do? Again, we'll talk about people not act naturally safe. I am as guilty as any random person you're ever going to find with that. I have become very safe though. I consider myself a safe driver. And recently, my wife and I both had to go get our insurance done last year. We got married last year in uh, 4th of July. And we met my insurance agent. We did all the stuff up when we're both getting. He looks at her and she's had last five years, two of them were her fault, in all fairness. But then after all that said and done, and the other one was so minor that it, it didn't even raise any, any real flag. It was a little bit fender bender that uh, she had hit in some bad weather. <clears throat> and then I'm like, I, then I'm like, the elbow owner, I'm like, oh, how many did I have? So I can't see any from your record. I'm like, can you see that again? You know what I mean? And of course, there comes she, I got whacked. You have a CDL? No, I did not have a CDL. But uh, I have driven uh, through a period of time, uh, in a two-year period of time, I did put 141,000 miles on my truck. Two years? In two years. And that was not, I wasn't getting paid to drive. Um, I would go places and, and, and I would be getting paid for what I would do when I'd get there, but it's not like I was getting like my mile for it. So, <clears throat> let's just say I got 20, 100 hours. Was that an easy? Oh, no, no, it was a full size non diesel truck though. Okay. So, hauling loads, typically, or weight. So, but again, safety must be learned, therefore, it must be taught. Who is the best safety director in the world? Who teaches more safety than anybody who's ever, you're ever going to see again in the rest of your life? Mom and Dad. Mama! <laughs> yeah. My mom, I had a call with to the state. You won't put that penny in the white socket? You won't do that again. I'm always like, uh, pick it up, try it again. I was rather well off the court, beating bikes in the middle of the school. But in general, if everyone had their mom as their safety director at work, what do you think the injury rate would happen? Zero. Yeah, because you don't ever want to, especially if you're at work. You can never tell mama I hurt because I was stupid or I did something wrong. But it's not because you're stupid, it's because you don't perceive the situation where you feel that way. <clears throat> it's easier to be unsafe than to be safe. Uh, you get positive reinforcement for negative behavior. How many people have seen, you can look at all of life scenarios where you get positive reinforcement for doing something you shouldn't do. Exactly. We're not going to go into all of the different possibilities of that. <laughs> Superman syndrome. I'm so quick, I'm so tough, I'm so agile, oh, never going to happen to me. Well, you know, again, even just a quarter Irish makes you three quarters crazy. 
So I'm, I always thought, you see the people, how many people have seen videos where people are driving like JLGs to like boom lifts? But not even extended out that far necessarily or, or that high up. But what's the rule in a boom lift? Anybody here know like the number one, absolute, can never have it? Well, yeah, when you're driving, to keep it low to the ground. Don't shoot it all the way out, right? You damn it, you're talking about? Well, there's a couple different types of manly. The one scissor lifts are straight up. Well, I'm talking about like articulated boom lifts. Yeah, they go out. Yeah. Anybody here know what the, the number one rule in those are? Have to wear a safety harness. It has to be strapped in or locked in. Typically, we're you can't move it, but the guard uh, down. No, they still move. No, they'll move. Now, I mean, typically, I'm talking about either climbing or you got a gate, you know what I mean? You're going to latch it, you're going to put a, put a chain across, something like that. But again, so I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I get it. People should have, they should have their harnesses on, especially if you're working 10, 12, 14, 25 feet, 50 feet in the air, whatever it may be. Uh, I know there was a death, Notre Dame had a grad student get flipped out high up in the air two, three years ago, and uh, he was videotaping the practice. Huh? So, uh, you know, he wasn't strapped in, but you know, it was high winds and there's extenuating circumstances I'm not going to get into about, but again, if it happens, you know what I mean? So, I'm always thinking to myself, there's no way I'm ever going to get, there's, I, I'm telling you, I wouldn't get flipped out. It wouldn't be me. I would not be the guy who actually got flipped out. So I have one of the things I do check is I, I have a few different sites and you know, websites I go to and I look up stuff and I see this funny safety videos and pictures and scenarios and what's going on and stuff like that. And uh, the one is a guy, first day of work, operating one of these JLGs. And I'm telling you, he wasn't this high off the ground. He wasn't as high up as that off the ground. He wasn't extended out that far, and he wasn't going fast. And he just hit a little boom. And let me tell you, it flipped him almost, I'd say, from me to you. And I watched it just happen so fast, I said, okay, I'm getting flipped. Everyone's getting flipped. Whether you think you're that guy or not, they always flip you. This guy, as far as I know, is world-class gymnast. He's getting flipped out of this thing. You are not staying in the bucket. When it decides to spring and toss you, you're, you cannot react fast enough. It's like catching a bullet with your teeth in reality. I mean, that's your same odds, in my opinion. You should, so I, I always talk to myself, I wouldn't get flipped. It'll happen. So when we talk about Superman syndrome, it won't happen to me. It'll happen to you. There's something out there, no matter how tough and awesome you think you are. And here's the big one, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Young kids and their backs. They don't know. How many people here know about the back? Okay. It, well, yeah, it's all bad once it goes back. But you can't tell a 19 or 22 year old about it because they don't have the pain yet. You can't tell the whole room for him because he said he'd rather fall because he broke his back. I can tell a roofer. I got multiple roofer clients. I'm I've been up on all every type of roof you can imagine. I used to lay bricks and I used to see roofers. They say, one fell, he say, man, I never wear that harness again. He say, I'd rather fall into the ground. Well, they have retractable lanyards and all can show you. They got all kinds of stuff today to make it better. You're right. They used to have what was called a backbreaker. Anybody hear that? Okay. Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about? You literally have shit you sticking around. You're allowed to use those today, but it has to do with considered fall prevention. We're not going to get into all kinds of fall protection stuff here, but they do have equipment today, the five-point harnesses, they're attached to lanyards, they've got the, uh, you know, the, uh, not the one of the gold the day. Yeah. Oh, he had the lanyard. He said he never wear it no more. I think he fell off. I, I, I was on the other side when he fell, but he said it hurt his groin then off. Well, he didn't have it tight enough. I, here, sir. Mm -hmm. Another quick story, this is very quick, okay? I was going training on land here, fall protection safety, and I'm sitting there, and, and it's a room a little bigger than this, and the guy back in the back corner was the union steward, you know what I mean, or whatever. And he was trying to do union business on my safety meeting. So he went with anything he had to say. He wouldn't pay attention to people going back, he's figuring out all their stuff. And I'm like, whatever, I, I'm not going to sit there and argue with him. 
But I told everybody in the safety meeting, and of course he saw business, and so he was the last one to do this. And part of the thing we had to do, obviously, they had a new wench, and they're checking it, and everyone's jumping, and you're falling, not a, your fall's not from the, here to the floor, but you're stepping up a set of steps, and you're dropping maybe from like here to there. And then the next guy's up there showing, and they're teaching people how to wench people up and pull them up for confined, basically a confined space uh, retrieval practice, in case somebody gets hurt, how do we pull them out of a confined space situation. And I'm telling everybody, when you're going to fall, you need to have this tight. You do not want a loose harness and fall. And this sounds like this might be what happened. Because you're going to have a problem that you're not going to be happy about. <laughs> and there's nobody in the world who's going to crank that winch up fast enough. And we offered, there's me and there's two other guys, two other safety guys who are going on longer than me, and we're offering, if you need help, you need to show how to do it, how to tighten this stuff, and we'll give them a little instruction for other people who've got into the new, because it's all a new system, everything was brand new, that's why we had the whole company in there. And uh, it was a car company, I do believe. Either that or a grain silo company, I can't remember. But back to the point is, is, is the guys are all going, and everybody does fine, everybody listens to what they say, they all tighten the legs up real good. They always make sure they're nice and secure. They have the back up. They're all in the right position. They jump and they're ready. You know, I mean, when you fall off a roof, this isn't going to be the way you fall. But I don't need to get hurt today while I'm here. Okay? And hopefully you'll learn, but he screamed like you can't believe when he jumped off this thing. Told us we did it to him on purpose. <laughs> but he did not tighten the legs up because he knew better. He had Superman syndrome, uh, and then he had Superwoman syndrome when it was over. <laughs> so I'm just gonna sit there and say, he, I, I can't believe. I mean, he was high pitched too. And it's like a, you know, rugged big dude, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy could probably, you know, handle some pain, not that pain. But so when you think it's not gonna happen to you, and you're too tough, and you're too this, that, and the other thing doesn't exist. Superman syndrome uh, is only. It's really a great way to do it. It. Next, we're talking about bad habits. Bad habits are three times faster to learn than good habits, and three times harder to break. Uh, good habits three times harder to break. Don't know why? It's just the way it is. Automatic pilot. Okay. Here we're talking about automatic pilot. Everyone in here has been on automatic pilot. You're probably on automatic pilot right now. Right? No. Some of you are. Some of you aren't. That's okay. So, what is automatic pilot? Not necessarily. Just force a habit. You just continue to do over and over. Force a habit. You've got whatever you've got going on. How many people here have driven a place they've been to 100 times, 1,000 times, and you've missed your exit? Okay. How in the world did you miss your exit? Cell phone. I'm going to sit there. We can talk hours on just cell phone use in a vehicle. Okay. And the reason why the fatalities in Ohio are so high right now is distracted driving. We have less and less societal drinking and driving accidents, which was the main factor, the number one reason why we were having fatalities in Ohio. Those are coming down, and our fatalities on the road are going up. Distracted driving. So not, it's really <laughs> well, I mean, anything you could be doing that you're dealing with, a distraction. And then the distraction is texting, face, whatever you want to do on your, you know, Cell phone, that is killing people like crazy, injuring people like crazy, mutilating. Question on that. So they're always now they're hooping and hollering, you get all this stuff on your new car and it's distracting people. Why do they keep putting it in the car? Well, because Money. it sells. I mean, that's stuff we're doing. Because the automotive manufacturers, our job is to make money. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I do believe if you have talked through your car technology. You're going to be a much safer driver than if you're sitting there going up with things. Uh, you can answer your phone, voice answering. I'm not sitting there. Going to, I'm not going to sit here and say that that's the safest way about it. But let me ask you this: Anybody in this room not take a phone call and bust them up in your vehicle? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you still talk. You still talk somehow. Right. But it's safe. I agree that it's safe. I had the uh, hands-free technology when it first came out. You know what I mean? But it's what happens. People take calls in your vehicle. And taking a call in your vehicle is not necessarily the, the 
full measure of the distracted driving that I'm referring to. But one of the other things, looking stuff up, texting somebody, checking out a destination, like I wanted to say today, when I was up here, I typed into my cell phone the Lorraine County Community College. I was pretty sure I knew where it was. But I've never, I've never actually been in here, been here before. But 